The shadowy world of drug trade and cartels is seen as the playground of personalities like Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, Pablo Escobar, and Nemesio Seguera Cervantes, aka El Mencho. However, some reputable members of the public sometimes find themselves caught in this realm so much that they've no option but to participate in it. This is the riveting story of Jen Li Ye Gon, a Chinese-Mexican businessman who successfully washed millions of dollars for a ruthless drug cartel. $200 million. Sometime in 2006, Mexican security operatives received an anonymous tip about how one of the most reputable businessmen in the country was supplying pseudoephedrine to the Sinaloa drug cartel. This revelation set in motion a comprehensive investigation, spanning months and even drawing the attention of officials from the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration. While this investigation was ongoing, detectives intercepted 19.7 tons of pseudoephedrine at a port in southern Mexico on the 25th of December that same year. And surprisingly, this shady package was traced back to the very business magnate under scrutiny by the authorities. Documents associated with this dubious consignment initially claimed it to be a chemical that had no existence in reality. However, meticulous laboratory tests ultimately unveiled the truth. The substance was indeed a derivative of pseudoephedrine. So, in March 2007, local security operatives, in partnership with the DEA, stormed the Lomas de Chapultepec neighborhood in Mexico for what would be a historic mission, and indeed one that would send shockwaves across the country and across the entire world. Codenamed Operation Dragon, this mission was probably planned to be one of those routine operations. You know, that type of operation where the police show up suddenly with a search warrant to ransack a house and apologize at the end of the whole process for any inconvenience caused. But this turned out to be different. When federal agents arrived at their target in the Lomas de Chapultepec neighborhood of Mexico City, they were met with an astonishing sight. Inside a luxurious pink and white mansion, they stumbled upon something beyond belief. Stacks of cash, hidden in every nook and cranny. From wardrobes to suitcases, built-in wall storages, hallways, and even the kitchen, money was stashed everywhere. The grand total recovered from this villa amounted to an astounding $200 million. Within a few hours, the news had spread even to the most remote areas of the globe, as journalists reported what is regarded today as the largest drug cash seizure in history, and perhaps one of the best moments of President Felipe Calderon's administration, and rightfully so. It's a discovery that even the FBI, in its long history of hunting down stupendously rich criminals cannot boast of. The astonishing discovery consisted of a staggering two-ton haul of $100 bills, a trove so immense that it took officials a full 48 hours to meticulously count every bill. Amidst this sea of greenbacks, law enforcement also confiscated a substantial cash, including 200,000 euros, 157,500 pesos, a modest assortment of Hong Kong dollars, 11 centenaries made of pure gold, a small set of automatic weapons, and seven vehicles. In addition to this unfolding drama, the authorities arrested seven suspects, including two Chinese nationals. Interestingly, the police didn't find a single ounce of drugs at the scene, and the man believed to be behind the scheme, Zhen Li Ye Gon, was conspicuously missing from the country at the time. Following this startling raid, the Mexican government announced a range of restrictions on pseudoephedrine. In the wake of the March raid, Mexico now requires prescriptions for medicines that contain pseudoephedrine and blocks over-the-counter sales of the decongestant, the statement read. However, the government never really seemed to have a grasp of the whereabouts of the man at the center of the whole saga. Born on the 31st of January 1963, Zhen Li Yegon grew up in the less fancied neighborhoods of Shanghai, China. Despite his modest beginnings, Yegon pursued a path of self-improvement, securing good education, and ultimately earning a degree in chemical engineering from the university. The next phase of his life, however, lay beyond the four walls of the People's Republic of China. In 1990, Yegon embarked on a life-changing journey, leaving China behind to settle in Mexico. Initially, his endeavors revolved around importing Chinese trinkets into the South American nation. However, within a year, he pivoted his focus towards the importation of Chinese pseudoephedrine. Leveraging his expertise as a chemical engineer, Yagon skillfully expanded his importation enterprise, and in a matter of years, he founded Unimed Chem Mexico, a pharmaceutical company that would ascend to remarkable heights, raking in hundreds of millions of dollars. His contributions were so significant that in 2002, he was granted Mexican citizenship by the president himself. Central to the company's financial success was its involvement in the importation and distribution of pseudoephedrine and ephedrine, chemical compounds used in the production of over-the-counter cold medications like Sudafed. But critically, these two products are also key elements in manufacturing methamphetamine, a notorious drug substance that has become one of the most lucrative income streams for Mexican cartels. As one of the biggest drug-peddling organizations in town, the Sinaloa cartel is seen as one of the key players in the meth trade industry. In fact, Jose
Jose Luis Leon, a researcher for Mexico's Autonomous Metropolitan University, describes the cartel as a global enterprise in the meth market. At the peak of its operation, the Sinaloa cartel was responsible for 80% of the U.S. meth trade. Their strategy was both audacious and far-reaching. The Sinaloa cartel sourced ephedrine and pseudoephedrine from countries such as China, Thailand, India, and various other Asian nations, funneling these precursors into Mexico through key ports like Mazatlan, Lazaro Cardenas, and Manzanillo. In addition, they built several synthetic drug labs across different Mexican states, including Jalisco, Sonora, Michoacan, and Sinaloa. These labs were where the raw materials underwent transformation into potent methamphetamine before being shipped northward to the United States. In essence, the more pseudoephedrine and ephedrine the Sinaloa cartel could procure, the greater their methamphetamine production capacity. This surging expansion was met with resistance on the part of the Mexican authorities. In June 2022, personnel of the Mexican security forces locked down 16 clandestine labs alone, including one containing 2,000 liters of suspected methamphetamine. They also seized vehicles and dozens of 50-liter metal and plastic drums, tanks, reactors, and other plumbing infrastructure used to process and store precursor chemicals like sulfuric acid. But suspiciously, the security operatives didn't make a single arrest in connection to the drug labs. Even worse, the illegal flow of pseudoephedrine and ephedrine into Mexico continued almost seamlessly. In recent years, the Sinaloa cartel has been accused of running methamphetamine labs in new territories across Asia, including Malaysia. Authorities have also found enough evidence to suggest that this criminal narcotic gang has been purchasing heroin from Afghanistan, and activities of the group have been spotted in the Philippines where arrested Sinaloa gang members were mysteriously assassinated. However, China seems to be the main source of methamphetamine precursor drugs for the Sinaloa cartel and other Mexican drug peddling gangs, and critically, Unimed and some other licensed pharmaceutical companies in Mexico ensured that the flow of these products was not only seamless, but also constant. As the authorities eventually came to learn, Zhen Li Ye Gon and his accomplice were quite calculative in their move. Rather than smuggle these chemicals in small quantities, the Mexican-Chinese businessman went through the rigorous procedure to get the required license. This allowed him to import thousands of metric tons of pseudoephedrine and ephedrine from China and other parts of the world into Mexico. The approval given to Unimed Farm by the Mexican government was supposed to cover for all importation of pseudoephedrine and ephedrine up until July 2005. However, further investigation showed that Ye Gon and some Unimed employees continued to import these two into Mexico even after the expiration of the company's license. At about the same time, the use of methamphetamine and other synthetic drugs was becoming a real problem in the United States. The side effects of the production of these drugs were so devastating that the government often turned down the opportunity to the properties where these drugs are produced because of the exorbitant cost of remediation. So, in collaboration with Mexican authorities, the DEA initiated the tracking of substantial shipments of pseudoephedrine and ephedrine traveling between China and Mexico. It was during this phase that their scrutiny extended to the activities of Zhen Li Yagon. He didn't exactly have a past criminal record, however. Extensive investigation revealed he has some kind of ties with the Sinaloa cartel. But notably, some of his close allies were also placed under the magnifying glass of the authorities. His cousin, Ye Yongqing, who also doubled as an employee at Unimed, was arrested for his involvement in organized crime and other illegal activities, including synthetic drug production and possession of illicit funds. But despite all of this, Ye Gon and his legal representatives refuted the allegations. However, the discovery of $200 million at his apartment in Mexico confirmed everything the officials needed to know about his involvement with the Sinaloa cartel. Officials also carried out a snap raid on two of his warehouses in Mexico City, recovering several boxes filled with purses, fake Christmas trees, and 12 bags of pseudoephedrine. Corpora o Cuello. Understandably, it must have been hard for law enforcement agents to come to terms with the fact that a respectable member of the society like Ye Gon would be involved in illegal business. But perhaps the most intriguing thing about the whole situation was how he was able to amass such an enormous amount in cash, let alone store it in a single mansion. The whole event uncovered some of the financial extravagance enjoyed by drug cartels, especially those in Mexico. The Sinaloa cartel at some point raked in unprecedented profits of around $3 billion annually. As expected, the profits are shared across the hierarchy and members of the cartel. Eventually, it gets into the hands of people like Zhen Li Ye Gon, who reportedly launders it for the cartel. While Ye Gon regularly denied these claims, law enforcement agents in America discovered something strange about him. Zhen Li Ye Gon was a regular visitor to Las Vegas, and it wasn't for his chemical business. As we all know, the city of Las Vegas is the gambling headquarters of the world, and the Mexican-Chinese businessman had an unhealthy appetite for betting. According to sources at the U.S. Department of Justice, Zhen Li was a fan of high-stakes poker, 
Vega and the single largest all-cash upfront gambler of the iconic Sands Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip in Nevada. According to sources, Yergon reportedly lost over $150 million to the slot machines at Sand Hotel, and this further drew the attention of the DEA to him. They suspected that he used the casino to launder some of the cartel's dirty cash. The Mexican-Chinese businessman supposedly wired huge sums of cash to the casino in advance, and when he arrived in Las Vegas, he'd lose some and get checks from the house for the rest of the money. And once he returned to Mexico, he'd present these checks at the bank and deposit the funds into accounts from where it could be used to facilitate the operations of the cartel. Yegon was also one of the biggest customers of HBMX, the Mexican division of HSBC Bank, according to Unconfirmed. Reports, the British banking giant relaxed its rule, which allowed Yegon move $90 million through its financial infrastructure to three other banks in Mexico. It was a well-planned money laundering scheme that caught the security agencies off guard, especially because the casino at Sands Hotel and his account handlers at HSBX failed to keep some of the obligations required of them. Normally, under the US law, casinos and gambling organizations are mandated to report suspicious activities from customers, but somehow, the Sands Hotel decided that the staggering upfront payments of Mr. Genley weren't suspicious. On the contrary, they treated him with the utmost regard, giving him access to special bank accounts that were originally used to facilitate payments of pilots who offer services to the hotel. In fact, in recognition of his outstanding patronage, the Sands Casino gave out luxury cars to Yegon and also refunded 40% of his losses. At this point, it seemed like his efficient money laundering scheme could never be busted. However, he ran out of luck in 2007 when all of a sudden, the decision makers at Washington and Mexico took a special interest in his case. Um, we were instructed, get this guy, don't do anything else, and you better get him if you know what's good for you, kind of. Uh, the White House has taken an interest in this, and so has the president of Mexico, the newly elected President Calderon. So President Bush, President Calderon, very interested in getting this guy, as is our administrator, Karen Candy. Following the raid of his properties, Yergon filed for asylum and fled to the United States where he went undercover. But after months of surveillance and intelligence gathering, the DEA had begun to close in on him. They knew he was somewhere in the country, but they couldn't really tell where. DEA agents had copies of his picture and an indictment from the United District of Columbia that permitted them to apprehend Yegon as soon as they found him. But in the meantime, officers took turns to watch over the houses of people that had close contact with Yegon with hopes that he'd show up someday. This exercise continued for weeks and there was no breakthrough until one day, the lawyer of the accused announced a press conference in Washington, D.C. Expectedly, the DEA thought they had hit the jackpot with this announcement. They only needed to show up at the venue of the press conference, and they would be able to apprehend the most wanted money launderer at the time. So, on the day of the event, they arrived at the venue, and to their surprise, Zhen Li Yegon was nowhere to be found. The press conference was held virtually through video conferencing. It was another genius move from a man who had mastered the act of evading the long arms of the law. A few days after this decoy event, the lawyer called for another press conference. This time, the authorities weren't too convinced that Yegon would show up, but they attended anyway, and the business mogul was absent, but they were able to watch him through the screen set up by his lawyer. In his speech, Yegon explained that contrary to what the authorities thought, the $200 million found in his mansion wasn't his. He stated that the whole situation was a setup designed to make him take the fall for their criminal scheme. This theory was quite awkward, because assuming he was telling the truth and the money found in his home actually belonged to some other people, how was he going to explain the hefty sums he spent on gambling? Also, he could have reached out to the authorities to report the people who were trying to blackmail him, like he claims. It's safe to say the DEA weren't sold with his story, even more so because he seemed to be playing with their intelligence. This made them even more determined to arrest him. While the lawyer did well enough to shield his client, he wasn't clever enough to outsmart the DEA. In fact, the whole virtual press conference plan eventually played into the hands of the law enforcement agents who obtained a court order to get the phone records of the lawyer, and with the help of sophisticated technology, they were able to trace Yegon's phone signal to a lavish villa right in the heart of Washington, D.C. However, there was no signing of him or any human within the house. So, they set up mobile surveillance camos around the house. Days turned to weeks and nothing was found. While the wait was on, the DEA obtained a search warrant just in case they needed to bust things up. As the surveillance lingered on, security operatives noticed some strange movements. All of a sudden, a car pulled up from the house and into the street and headed straight to PJ Rice Bistro, a Chinese restaurant in Wheaton, Maryland. They trailed the vehicle and discovered it was driven by Zhen Li Ye Gon, the same culprit they had been chasing for months. The suspected money launderer and his wife were in the process of ordering codfish and carrots when officials of the DEA immediately swung into action. They arrested him and drove straight back to his residence to carry out an extensive search. Apart from his few million dollars, officials didn't find anything incriminating in his home. Interestingly,
Interestingly, Yegon's arrest coincided with the arrival of President Calderon, who flew into Washington for a state visit to the White House. Following his arrest, the DEA hounded the Sands Hotel and Casino for its role in aiding Yegon's money laundering scheme. The hotel denies any wrongdoing, claiming that it carried out due diligence into Mr. Yegon's source of wealth. Ultimately, those people signed credit on behalf of their name and that debt should be collected, a spokesperson for the business said in a statement. If credible proof is presented that an employee or employees were complicit, we will promptly take appropriate action as required by our policies. The Sands Hotel and Casino even went as far as hiring an independent investigator to physically investigate and verify the companies Yegon has in Mexico. But at the end of the whole saga, it agreed to pay a lump sum of $47.4 million as a settlement to the U.S. Treasury. HSBC was also investigated for money laundering crimes, and shockingly, the bank was found to have poor controls that allowed drug cartels, including the Sinaloa gang, to launder at least $881 million. For this, HSBC agreed to pay nearly $2 billion in settlement to the U.S. authorities. Even in incarceration, Jen Li Ye Gon continued to reiterate his innocence about the money found in his Mexico apartment. Speaking to detectives, Ye Gon said a significant part of the cash stash found in his home belonged to high-ranking officials in the Mexican government. According to Ye Gon's confession, Mexico's labor secretary at the time, Javier Lozano Alacon, ordered a police convoy to escort $150 million into his house. This money was supposed to be used for President Felipe Calderon's election campaign. Of course, the president denied this allegation, claiming that Ye Gon invented the story to avoid prosecution. Speaking through a translator, President Felipe Calderon said, this is a crude and foolish strategy to avoid Mexican justice, and it will fail. This man will go to prison. According to the evidence, this was the biggest blow ever to methamphetamine trafficking in Mexico or in any other country. As if that wasn't shocking enough, Ye Gon claims that this supposed request from Javier Lozano was accompanied with death threats. I first met Mr. Javier Alacon in the first week of May 2006, Ye Gon explained during an interview. He showed me two suitcases. I opened one. It was full of money. And then he said, you either cooperate or the neck. This was the origin of the phrase, Cupaira o cuelo, which means cooperate or you'll be strangled. The term eventually became a popular joke at the time. In fact, a poll conducted by La Reforma, a local Mexican newspaper, revealed that many citizens believed that there was an iota of truth in Yegon's story. This wasn't helped by the fact that Transparency International, an anti-corruption global society organization, ranked Mexico as one of the world's most corrupt countries at the time. Obviously, this doesn't in any way validate Yegon's claims, but his lawyers maintained that their client was telling the truth. In fact, after his arrest, a sober Jen Li Yegon pleaded with the DEA not to extradite him to either Mexico or China, because he would never be able to get a fair trial there. Please don't send me to Mexico or to China. Meanwhile, the US government, in its efforts to convict Ye Gon, filed an indictment against the Chinese Mexican government for illegally shipping four containers of pseudoephedrine and ephedrine in Mexico as part of a conspiracy to aid and abet the flow of methamphetamine into the United States. Although his lawyers were eager to prove Ye Gon's innocence, they were more than happy to have him held in the US. The Mexican government, again, has done a marvelous job of painting our guy as a member of the drug cartel. We have filed for asylum, so I think we're going to have a five to ten year battle on that extradition request, one of Mr. Ye Gon's legal representatives said during an interview with reporters. Despite the heap of credible evidence that prosecutors thought they had against Ye Gon, the legal battle between US authorities and the supposed criminal didn't turn out as most people had expected it to be. Extradition. With 93 foreign offices across 69 countries, the DEA prides itself as one of the most effective and efficient anti-drug agencies in the world. Between 1996 and 2016, 87% of individuals prosecuted by the agency were convicted. In fact, only 3% of federal drug defendants opt to go on trial. This means that about 97% of all drug defendants take the plea bargain almost as soon as the DEA offers them that option, but definitely not Mr. Ye Gon. Instead of accepting the plea agreement and serving a relatively short sentence, he chose to go on trial, and thankfully, he had competent lawyers. In addition, the circumstances around the case seemed to favor him. As the lawsuit dragged on, key witnesses began to recant their testimonies. Some even declined to appear in court, and the Chinese government refused to release documents that could have helped to convict him. And in Ye Gon's defense, the authorities didn't find meth on him or his property. So, the only substantial evidence they had against him was the four containers of methamphetamine precursor products illegally imported into Mexico by Ye Gon's pharmaceutical company. The 
businessmen argued that the order for the shipment was made in error, and in any case, they were meant for the production of legal drugs. All of these loopholes weakened the case of the US government, and eventually, a federal judge, Emmett Sullivan, struck out at the case in August 2009. According to a piece in the National Law Journal, the federal prosecutors even admitted at some point that they had no case against Yergon. During a court session, one of the prosecutors said, I am not proffering that I have interviewed a witness, you know, who is a drug trafficker who said I got ephedrine or pseudoephedrine from him so that to me would be a smoking gun kind of witness. I don't want the court to think that's what I'm saying because I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that there's other kinds of testimony. The inefficiencies of the DEA were highlighted in the judgment delivered by Judge Sullivan. To start with, he blamed the prosecutors for taking months to reveal the witness, which was against the laws of the Justice Department policy and the Constitution. He also went further to question the manner in which officials of the Justice Department handled the evidence. The jury also noted the refusal of the Mexican government and its agencies to some of the seized materials that could have served as evidence to prosecute Yegon. This court made numerous inquiries of government counsel as to just what the status of the requests were to get drug samples for testing purposes, to provide evidence for the prosecution, and basically, Mexico just snubbed the United States. Considering all of these factors, it was clear that the US prosecutors didn't have a solid case against Yegon. His legal representative at the time said his client was incredibly grateful and emotional about the outcome of the case. Despite escaping the dragnet of the DEA, Yegon knew he wasn't entirely free, at least not until he settled his score with the Mexican authorities. Thanks to the expertise of his lawyers, Gen Li Yegon was able to resist extradition for a while. However, after nine years of resistance, Yegon lost his case. As expected, his legal representatives filed an appeal. In the documents tendered to the court, they argued that two of Yegon's co-defendants had been tortured in Mexico and their client could suffer the same fate if he's extradited. Speaking to reporters, Gregory Smith, a member of Yegon's legal team said, there is a very serious risk he will be tortured or killed in prison to the point where I'm losing sleep over it. But despite their pleas, the appeal was struck out by Federal Appeals Court in Richmond, Virginia, and Yegon was eventually extradited to Mexico in 2016. His extradition caused some sort of buzz as officers of the U.S. Marshals escorted him on a flight from Virginia to Mexico City, where he was handed over to the local authorities. Today, the fugitive from Mexican justice Gen Li Yegon was extradited. Mexico's Deputy Attorney General Salvador Sandoval in an interview following Yegon's arrival on Mexican soil. He is considered responsible for the crimes of organized crime, possession of firearms for the exclusive use of the Army, Navy, and Air Force, and operations with resources of illicit origin. As soon as he landed in Mexico, Gen Li Yegon was taken to the Altiplano prison, the same penitentiary facility that El Chapo, the founder of the Sinaloa cartel, escaped from in July 2015. While Yegon's case was ongoing, a couple of his acquaintances were also undergoing trial. One of the defendants, Juan Yaca Diaz, was acquitted of charges relating to organized crime and drug peddling by a Mexican court. Similarly, two of Yegon's brothers, who were arrested during the 2007 raid, were released, and throughout the duration of the lawsuit, none of the accused employees from Unimed were convicted either in the US or in Mexico. However, several of their assets were seized and sold off. In 2014, a $9.5 million property belonging to Yegon was acquired by the state government. Five years later, in 2019, the three-story mansion where authorities recovered $200 million was auctioned for $5 million. The sprawling luxury mansion built on over 1,200 square meters of landscape features king-sized bathrooms, huge marble fireplaces, spacious rooms, massive kitchens, lavish stairwell, and chandeliers amongst other extravagant amenities. After touring this opulent villa, a New York Times reporter, Damien Cave, revealed that he saw three child-sized toothbrushes in one of the bathrooms and other strange items that's really hard to explain. For me, these tiny toothbrushes were haunting, the kind of detail that lingered because it revealed what I saw in so many of these homes, a combination of not just excess and risk, but also family life. The reporter also recalls seeing a syringe, oriental rugs, minimalist leather couches, a knockoff of Picasso's famous Guernica painting, and a school photo of a boy under a DVD of a movie titled The Corrupter. Aside from Yegon's properties, the Mexican government also auctioned off jewels and armored vehicles seized from other drug traffickers. Head of Mexico's Property Administration and Disposal Service, Ricardo Rodriguez, told the Latin American Herald Tribune that the proceeds from the auctioned jewels alone was worth over $500,000. One can only imagine how much they would have made from the sales of all the seized assets. In any case, the Mexican government promised that the proceeds will be channeled into different social causes, including the development of infrastructure and the fight against drugs. However, multiple reports have emerged suggesting that the funds may have been diverted into private hands. This comes even as the death toll from Mexico's drug war continues to hit alarming numbers and even the law enforcement agents are not entirely safe from the crossfire. For instance, two of the officers who raided Yale
Yegon's mansion were mysteriously found in Guerrero. Yegon wasn't directly linked to these killings, but to some extent, it highlights his close relationship with the notorious members of the Sinaloa cartel. Thanks for watching this video to the end. If you've enjoyed it, please click on any of the cards on the screen to watch more interesting videos like this one.